Before we get started, I just want to uh, just say welcome. The first thing I want to do before I get going is introduce Sheila Domkaler. And she's, uh, <laughs> many of you know her, she's, she's a museum professional that works for the uh, Discovery Center and PVMA, and she's been a consultant to many of the cultural groups around here, including us. She helped us get this whole exhibit going when we opened to the public. And um, we're grateful that she brought us in on this Discovery Center Smithsonian uh, uh, exhibit. So start with there. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Sheila Dom Kaler. I do see some familiar faces. Um, I, I wear various hats. I've had different jobs around, around the area. Um, so here today, in the capacity I'm here today is as the outreach coordinator at the Pocumtic Valley Memorial Association. Um, and we are part of the, one of the um, partners in the, bringing the Crossroads exhibit to the Great Falls Discovery Center. Uh, the Friends of the, of the Discovery Center applied for a grant and um, part of that was to, um, the requirement was to partner with other organizations to help all of us build our capacity uh, and to have a companion exhibit. So um, I was responsible for that over at the Great Falls Discovery Center. So if you haven't been over yet to see the Smithsonian's um, traveling exhibit there, um, I t of course encourage you, I know you all will get there at some point. And there is a companion exhibit with some local history there too. And then we have, um, we've worked with, so the partners are um, the Friends, the Friends uh, um, were um, sponsored, this grant was provided by Mass Humanities. And um, the Friends of the Great Falls Discovery Center were joined by Pocumtic Valley Memorial Association, PVMA, which is uh, the umbrella organization for Memorial Hall Museum and uh, the Montague Public Libraries, River Culture, and New England Public Media. Um, but the exhibit, Crossroads Change in Rural America, you know, I, when I grew up in suburbia, New Jersey and then Illinois, and, but uh, we visited my family, my grandfather's family had a farm in New Hampshire, so I thought of that as rural, you know, farms, fields, forests. We also used to travel from Illinois where I lived down to Springfield, and there was the, that, that kind of rural, big farms, dark, rich soil. So that was my idea of rural, and I had no idea that rural also included industry, that there was industrial history that went with rural America. So um, when I was in, in grad school and worked here with the Museum of Our Industrial Heritage and now over at the Great Falls Discovery Center, I've learned so much that, that you know, with every story of a farm, farm, fields, forest, there's an industrial story too. So we, we thought about, um, you know, the canal, such, a, such an obvious part of the, the industrial story in Turner's Falls, but I'm just going to use it um, as an outline here. I, I proposed to Jim that this program be, you know, take a look at these points on the timeline for the canal in Turner's Falls, what, you know, why a canal and then how it changed, and then think about, well, what was going on in the rest of Franklin County at that time? So before 1798, there was no canal in Turner's Falls. It was, you know, the, there was the indigenous story there and, and farmland, the settlers, the farmland. So that's, those are all stories on their own. But in 1798, following on the heels of a canal in Holyoke, the, the uh, proprietors of blocks and canals built a canal to, for navigation. That was the first reason, because ships couldn't get past the Great Falls that were there. So 1798, the first canal was built. It took a different path than today. So today it goes along the river here. But the first canal, it was a series of locks that went from where it starts today over to Montague City. So, and it was just to get past the falls. So shallow, narrow, small. That was 1798 and it was had a couple decades of good use until the railroad came along and railroads were a much more efficient way to move goods and people. So by the 1850s, um, I think the last boat went through, I think, 1856, somewhere around there, uh, through, the, through the canal. So it basically was abandoned and, you know, just, just, just nothing happening there. Until along came Alva Crocker in the 1860s with this idea of creating an industrial city, another Lowell or another Holyoke. Um, and so he bought rights from the proprietors and then sold them. He was very well connected, knew a lot of people, um, had been a big proponent of the railroads. 
So he immediately built um, the Turner's Falls Pulp Company. It was one of the first uh, companies in the country to, to grind up wood, uh, wood for pulp. Um, and then the, the paper company came along, they merged. Russell Cutlery bought rights right away. So along, you know, they, they made the canal larger, longer, changed the, the route a bit. Um, and, then, and then, you know, the, the mills thrived. So that's a whole, whole story. Um, until the early 1900s when, uh, you know, there was electricity and, and, and we didn't need water to power to, to turn the, the turbines and, and um, the technology had changed. And so that's when the, the canal had its, its third purpose. So first navigation, second was to power the mills, um, mechanical power, and then the third was hydropower. So um, cat, the, the station number one was built. I think they started that in 1904. And then by 1912, they started um, enlarging the canal yet again, and the dam, and changing the path a bit more. So those three iterations, so that's kind of the, the outline, if you think of the timeline, for what Jim's going to talk about. So, and I will turn it over to Jim. Okay, so who am I and why am I giving you this talk? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a scholar. I don't have any degrees or anything. Um, I've basically been immersed in this metalworking culture here in the Connecticut Valley. I've lived up and down the Connecticut Valley. My family also, going back generations, uh, uh, in fact, that's what brought some of my family here was to come to work in the metalworking industry. So it really resonates with me. I think it's a real important um, part of our history and part of American history. And uh, so myself and a, a you know, a handful of dedicated people are trying to keep keep this uh, alive and, and preserve uh, important facts and documents. Um, I don't mean this to be a lecture. I want it to be a conversation, really. Um, so anytime anybody wants to ask a question or if I lose somebody, um, you know, don't be afraid to uh, pop open with a question and we can we can talk it out. And, uh, and also at the end, We'll certainly have uh, uh, questions, and I'll be hanging around with you know other staff, and um, and hopefully we'll all learn something because I always learn something when we do a program like that, like this. So, um, but where do we get our facts? Just so you know, we've you know mostly we, there's some great local history books that we reference. In fact, most most of uh, what we reference comes from a book called The Conservative Rebel. It was a social history of Greenfield. It's a great, a great book. It's, uh, it's not just a boring history book. It's really a great story of this region. Um, so, and that's kind of what got people started to begin with. That was, that was made or written in the late 70s and uh, got a lot of people thinking about the history here. Um, we have a good archive. Um, we've had scholars and resident programs, so we have, you know, a number of papers that were published through our museum about the local history, um, unpublished family biographies, documents, um, interviews, media recordings, and just all, all kinds of collections, personal family collections, and so forth. So if anybody wants to do research, um, you know, we're open for, uh, you know, uh, any kind of a formal, uh, you know, scholarly type of research. I, I just want to give you a little museum background because I think it's important. And I was thinking to recently that I don't think a lot of people really know how the museum got started. We're celebrating 25 years. It, it originally started with a guy named Leon Weeks here in town um, and some people from Greenfield Tap and Die who thought that that company's history was worth uh, having a museum for. Another thing that got started around this time must have been in the early to mid 90s. If you remember, there was a book written called The Greatest Generation by Tom Brokaw. And Leon was involved. They had a contest nationwide. Whoever, what bookstore had the best display for that book would win this contest and Tom Brokaw would come and, and talk. At Greenfield, one, I don't know, was that the World Eye? or not, but, uh, and, and that got Leon interested in the World War II Greatest Generation themes, and so 
this museum kind of became a blend of uh, both of those. Um, so you're going to see a lot of references to the wars and things like that. Um, they were very important in this, you know, in, in these companies' histories. Since we're kind of uh, riffing off the uh, crossroads themes, one theme is this is a nat. It's always been a natural crossroads. You've got the rivers, the original Native American trails, now highways. It's just a natural place where intersections happen. So that's that's part of why things really sparked up here. Um, the other thing is it's an intersection of American history and American industrial history. You know, this right where we're sitting is really ground zero for the whole American experiment in a lot of ways. And I'm hoping to sh show you how the industrial history fits, fits into that. Um, again, like Sheila mentioned, the, the exhibit over at the, at the, uh, Discovery Center kind of focuses on rural agriculture, and and we certainly have that here. But what's also amazing is this this industrial dynamo that that took off here, and you really have to wonder how it happens. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little bit earlier than the periods of the of the canals and a little past it, just to kind of set set the stage. Um, but two relevant themes that I picked up off the, uh, the Crossroads exhibit was um, persistence and managing change. And when you, when you really look into this history, um, you know, the population here was constantly faced with the philosophical crossroads. Okay, what do we do now? Uh, one has to marvel in this climate with fires, floods, all manner of hardship and change financial panics, political upheaval. How did these, how did the people here manage these life altering changes and, and make choices? So that's, that's how I interpret the crossroads theme for, for our story here. Um, so what's the agenda today? So we, so I'm gonna try to relate events in Franklin County during, during these three years of the Turner's Falls canal development um, and this is one thing that I really find interesting about history and it really hooks me is that uh, by, by studying overlapping and parallel events we often miss when f focusing on specific events and people in other words you know most of us in school get a one-dimensional linear explanation of history you know this happened this happened and this happened and there's all kinds of parallel stories going on in all different kinds of things. And what's cool is you start connecting dots and this one dimensional thing gets to be two dimensional and then three dimensional and you really start seeing a model. You can actually envision a model of history. And that's, that's what I find interesting about all these studies. Uh, we always come away with something that um, it's also, history is just so fascinating to, me, fascinating to me. It helps me cope with our complex world. And we even chose as our slogan, history guides the future. It's not going to solve our problems, but it certainly can guide us with understanding of thing, how things happen in the past, where we make mistakes. Maybe we get back there and, 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 and make changes. So, um, and like myself, you might even discover your own family's history or something about yourself, which is really, really cool. So the era I'm going to cover right now is a little earlier than the 1790, but 1700s to 1850s. This is the era of early river transportation. It's the only way to get here, okay? It's, 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 this is the frontier. This is, this is, uh, out in the wilds and really the easiest way to get here is up the Connecticut River and in general this area was populated by people from the south not so much from the east coming up the rivers following the big the bigger tributaries and so forth um, it's also the era of early mechanical small-scale water power this mill was right next door here we're not really sure when it was built, but it certainly looks like 1700s 
technology. Um, it was a grain mill, and this area would have been dotted with small water power mills like this for the essentials, grain milling and, and lumber, things like that. Um, literally where you are sitting right now, okay, was part of the frontier town of Deerfield. Okay, this was Deerfield uh, up until the late 1800s. The, the Greenfield town line didn't move down to where it is. Um, okay, so figure from like 1670 up into the early 1700s, this is the frontier. This is, you know, the era of, uh, it's, it's the western frontier. There's beyond here is contested French and Indian wars. Um, you know, the, the uh, Britain is still trying to defend the western edge of the colonies, and this, this is where it is. Yet, we have from records that as early as 1699, water rights petitions are taken out for a dam on this site here along here okay um so very early on this this is uh the frontier um as a colony this is important as a colony of britain we were f absolutely forbidden to have metalworking industry during our whole colonization um and uh why do you think that would have been well um First thing, I mean, in that era, high tech was, in metalworking, was making arms, okay? And they certainly wouldn't want us to have our own arms industry. Um, the other thing is, pardon? Is that a question? No? Um, the other thing is, even things like high-end edge tools for agriculture and even cutlery was not available to the common people. Um, and so um, we were obliged to purchase anything like that from the mother country, okay? So really, there's, there's really not what you would call any kind of orchestrated industry to manufacture metal parts, okay? Metal type, type of uh, things, okay? And at this time, Sheffield in England with the guilds controls the world market for Cutlery, all kinds of cutlery, kitchen, you know, farm stuff, and it's high quality, it's expensive, and not, you know, certainly common people wouldn't, wouldn't be, uh, be able to afford this, right? Um, so, yeah, water power is abundant here. That's one, one, one geographic fact here. Um, so, um, also, you have, this is the era of the barge traffic. It's coming up the Connecticut River. You've got locks um, coming up the river um, even before 1790s. Boats were able to get up to the Deerfield River. And for those of you who live around here, you might know this as Cheapside. What's happening in this period is agricultural products are being shipped down, down the river to the ocean. Now remember, we're 100 miles inland at the foothills of the Appalachians and we can get ocean going transport here. It's quite remarkable. Before 1790, okay, or around that. And then in, in, you know, in response, any high end goods, probably high end fabrics, uh, steel, which we didn't have any high end steel. There was um, small scale iron mining here, which, you know, blacksmiths and small shops could have made castings and, and some, but not a sophisticated steel making, so there really wasn't high grade steel here to work with. Anything like that would have been brought up Connecticut River. So um, imagine that you got um, early on, it's flat boats like this depicts, and then later on actually steamboats are coming up and this is, Cheapside is right down here where you cross over into Deerfield on the Deerfield River. Okay, it's called Cheapside Landing, and we're not sure why it was called that, but a good guess would be that there's a famous docks and market in London on the Thames called Cheapside. So um, it, it, may, it may be that somebody uh, picked that name for it. It's still referred to as that. Um, so like I said, there's 
small scale iron. Um, so, and you have, it's an agricultural community and the farmer blacksmith would have been the metal worker. And um, I say farmer because that's, you know, probably who was making, had to make a lot of their own, own things. So um, you see it in our histories and some of the biographies we got, that's the way the blacksmiths get started. It's a necessity on the farms. We have to, have to make our own edge tools. Um, we're isolated out here. Um, and so we have to learn how to solve our own problems. And so they start the homegrown small metalworking shops, okay? Um, which will lead to metalworking industries later. Okay, the next little period in this is from the Revolutionary War, 1776 to the 1850s. What's going on now? A little broader perspective um, in American history. Um, of course, in our revolution, Western Mass plays an important role in the revolution and what comes after, Shays Rebellion um, and so forth. Um, also, um, this is a time when um, people start realizing that this is a very uh, good place to set up industry. You've got transportation, you've got water power. Um, so right after the rev this, in this period, right after the revolution, people start coming here to start industries. Um, and this was an interesting fact that came up recently. Another way that, that people started selling, uh, settling here was after the Revolutionary War, a lot of the soldiers that were coming back from the battles in the West came through here and saw this place and ended up coming back and settling here. And of course, this story repeats itself over and over. There's so many transplants that come here. But the story that sparked this was a gentleman came here uh, researching his family uh, genealogy and came across one, one ancestor that had fought with General Gage in the Saratoga battle where, where uh, General Burgoyne was defeated and, and the soldiers are coming back through here. You can read accounts of the various routes. They're all coming back to, east, to the eastern part of the state. And he said, this, this, this ancestor of mine settled in Halifax, Vermont. And we know he came through here, but he also, he settled there and he, and he married somebody from Greenfield. And he was really perplexed like that, like, what's the connection there? And so I was able to explain to him that in this, in this period, the people migrated up the watersheds. And Halifax, in this period of time, by, by the Green River was very much connected to Greenfield. And, and in some ways, it's, it still is. So all the routes people took and, and roads and things like that, the rivers really controlled how, how people moved around. And I thought that was interesting because um, there is a lot of connection between southern Vermont, southern New Hampshire, and this region because of the watershed. All the rivers come down from those areas here, and they would have been, um, they would have been settled. Um, another, oh, so in 1782, okay, right after the Revolutionary War, this is before we have a constitution and all that, another Revolutionary War veteran, a Colonel Moore, comes to Greenfield and on this site builds a six-story industrial park, a water-powered industrial park. It's considered to be America's first industrial park. He attracts people from all over, craftsmen from all over New England to come here. Hey, this is the place you want to set up. You got all the water power you want. Um, there's, you know, there's the beginnings of skilled, skilled workers here. Um, and it looks like it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to boom. So, yeah. Could you repeat the year? And Mr. Moore. 1780, in the 1780s, okay, it's right around the mid, I, I'd have to look exactly at the book, but it's, um, it's I think it's 1782, okay, because I know it's just before 
uh, the Shays Rebellion era and the Constitution is written, which is what, 89, something like that. So in that period, it might be 1787, but anyway, yeah. Um, the other thing, Colonel Moore. Colonel Moore, yeah. Um, and again, anybody wants any deeper reading into this, we can, we can do that at some point. The other very important thing that's happening at this time is the revolution's over and the founding fathers are convinced that we need an arms industry. Um, we barely made it through the Revolutionary War because um, beg, borrow, and stealing um, arms. So two national armories, and this is, I believe, 1794. Two national armories are cited, one in Springfield, Mass., one in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Okay. What else is happening at this time? Okay. 1790s, Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin. Okay, 1790s. And he also introduces to the founding fathers the idea of interchangeable parts in manufacturing. Okay. I say the concept because history sometimes isn't exact. And when he showed it to him, it actually didn't work. But but the concept was was valid enough that this initiates a whole new system that takes root in the armories. Okay, the federal government's gonna run the armory, it's going to implement this concept, which is in reality really is a quality control type of program. And this is going to introduce mass production. Uh, processes and, and, and concepts in, into manufacturing. It is a departure from what's going on in Europe in scale, okay? So these ideas originally come from Europe, but this whole new system we have here, political and economic, is going to, is going to do so, give it another twist and amplify it, okay? So um, the arms industry begins, okay, 1794. Um, another thing that's going on, so the cotton gin, if, if you know that this part of the history, makes slavery and cotton just expand exponentially. The cotton gin now, you can process a lot more cotton. Slavery expands and the mills in the north just keep growing, the textile mills, and um, and what that did was it created capital, and I'll, I'll explain this a little bit later, but it created capital to invest in these new companies here, all right? So that's very late, right around 1800, late 1790s. Um, 1812, this is less then two decades after the armories are established, America's fledgling arms industry helps defeat the British to secure westward annexation. Even up to this point, the western boundaries of what was the colonies are contested. And this finally puts the nail in the coffin of the British uh, grabbing land anywhere in the Midwest. And if you, if, you, if you want to read some interesting um, weapons that were used in that war, um, it's just amazing what happened within two decades of that armor, those armories. Um, and that's, that's, that's pretty much how I see how they won uh, 1812, okay? 1825, Erie Canal is finished, okay? Now there's, there's a route from the Hudson out to the Midwest, okay? And in 1825, the idea for a tunnel through the Hoosick Mountain to connect a water canal originally to Albany is proposed. So they know there's a need for a western route through that mountain. And originally it was, a, um, it was for continue the canal system, okay? Which is, is kind of hard to imagine. 
This is an early picture of the Russell Cutlery factory that was just a little bit down the river from here. So what's happening now is, well, one, one interesting piece of the armory system was the government provided all the materials and the machinery, but they brought in people from small shops as independent contractors. They would bid on uh, working on production lots, piecework, whatever. And then any new information, new ideas, they would bring back out into uh, you know, the general, with this fledgling industry here. So this is a departure, a great departure from the way things are done in Europe. A lot more open exchange of information. And this is a basis for what really caused this area to become such, such a dynamo. Um, this becomes known as the armory system. Later on, it becomes known as the American manufacturing system, and um, which has been adopted worldwide. Uh, if you buy a Toyota, it's made basically through the American manufacturing system. It was a whole quality system that was devised, and they really they took it to the next level. Um, so, 1834. We have a new country, and we don't have any industries. We don't have a metalworking industry. Even things like, even refinements like silk, we don't have. So people are starting to get the notion that, you know, hey, Americans ought to have their, their, their own industry. And it's almost really on a romantic notion that John Russell, old line Russell family from old Deerfield, they were in the textile and he was also the one down in Georgia uh, speculating on cotton, made, made a lot of money. He comes back to Greenfield and decides to start a cutlery factory. And this is the beginning of what you would call the democratization of technology. It's part of the ideals of the American uh, you know, project. Everybody should have access to, to the quality things of life. And that's really how they, they saw this at the beginning. Skinner, if you know the story of Skinner in uh, Northampton and Holyoke, the silk industry, the same thing. You know, these people um, were connected with the industries in England. They had some basic understanding of them. Um, some of them even had worked for years. And so they launched these businesses here. Russell did this with cutlery, okay? Now, uh, he... And this is the beginnings of what you see as the armory system filtering out into, you know, commodity, common manufactured goods. The cutlery really was the first outside of the arms industry where these ideas are starting to uh, take root. Um, one thing we still don't have is high-grade steel, and we wouldn't have it until almost World War I. So all the steel for all the cutlery here, came up the Connecticut River from Sweden, okay? It was all high-grade Swedish steel. That was one of the premises of this system is you start with the absolute best materials you can get. You employ mass production. Um, Russell set up, now this is still water power, mechanical water power, okay? Um, he sets up trip hammers, which basically take the place of a blacksmith hammering, right? He sets up a whole line of them. They start making tool and dies to stamp out uh, knife blades instead of having, you know, craftsmen banging them out on an anvil, okay? This really transforms um, metalworking industry. In fact, the uh, well, actually, this is a painting by Bob Merriam, and he wrote a book, The Russell Cutlery History, through the Deerfield Academy School. And this depicts the first, first Russell factory down the street. This, because of the way all this armory system was put into this factory, it's considered the first true metalworking industry in the United States. It's the first time where all the components of manufacturing something are brought into one system, under one building, okay? And it's just phenomenal how, how uh, productive they were. I'll get to that 
in a moment, okay? The other thing that's happening at this time, so 1834, okay? Very hard start to get this thing going. I mean, they, they get burned out, they get flooded out, but there's money here. There's money here from the cotton. There's money here from mining. There's, you know, people from here are going out and speculating. They're bringing back capital. There's money to invest in this thing. So people get burned out. There's, there's investors there to back them up. So it gets going. The other thing that's happening here is skilled immigrants are starting to be recruited from, from Europe cutlery centers. There's... There's skilled help here somewhat, but not, not enough, and there never is. So Russell and his contemporaries are, you know, they're down the docks in New York City looking for people coming with skills. And it's a little different story um, with the Irish coming here. Um, not, it was skilled, the skilled help, it, you know, but in this period, the mid-1800s, you know, people are leaving Europe and looking for new beginnings, and they're coming here. And you got a new system here. It's free enterprise, employment at will. You know, there's, it's very different than Europe. Um, you know, you're, there's no more indentured servants or anything like that. People are free to start their own businesses, work where they want to. And this attracts very young men from the UK. Um, uh, these are people that uh, would have been working in the cutlery industry there, and they've got ideas, and they've got energy. And two examples of that <clears throat> is someone named Matthew Chapman, who um, was recruited to come to the Russell factory. He was like 22 years old. And in, in, in the UK, they, you know, they were probably working for 10 years. They probably started out as kids. So they had, they had experience. He came and implemented most of the uh, real impressive innovations in producing cutlery. He was 22 years old. Within a year, Russell let him run the factory. Okay, you have a young 20-year-old guy. This was the opportunities here. Another, the, his buddy that came with him, Joseph Gardner, they both came together. They were from Scotland. They had worked in the Sheffield Guilds. Um, come together and um, Immediately, within a couple years of Russell, there's enough work where Lampson Goodnow starts in, in Shelburne Falls. And Chapman is lured away, and this is, repeats itself time and time again. He's lured away to go to a new company, and Joseph Gardner, who's, who is 18 years old, re Russell replaced Chapman with him. He's 18 years old, running this cutlery factory and implementing all these amazing new ideas and, and production processes. This is 1840s or so. This is our Franklin County. And again, the, the museum and this talk, it's focused on Franklin County. And it really makes sense once you study this because really it's all about water power. And the perimeter or the outside boundaries of Franklin County and we include Athol in this because it, it all focuses on the watershed. Miller's River, all the rivers coming down. You've got five major rivers coming together in Greenfield. So this is, this is, the, this is um, how the area is organized into a county level. And it really makes sense and it, and it works really good. So Franklin County at this point, 1840s, 1850s, you get a chance, look at the map on the back wall. Um, it's 1858, and there's hundreds upon hundreds of small mills up in the hill towns. Um, this is really where it gets going because the water power is small scale enough that pretty much anybody, if you've got the knowledge, can build, you know, build it. You don't have to take out a permit with the EPA or anything, you know. You just, you just build a mill and get going, right? Um, hundreds, and you can go, you, you travel through these towns now, a good example is like Conway. Conway, um, well, like some of the small towns, Conway, Shelburne, Buckland, even Ashburnham, Athol, Orange area, textiles, hand tools, measuring tools are starting to be developed. Conway at one time was a big textile town. Um, 
it, it rivaled Greenfield as the county seat at one point. Okay, so very much a lot of changes happen, and, and we'll see why. Why? But it pretty much starts up in in into the uh, in in the hill towns. 1905. We're going to get to the electrical power era, but in 1905. Um, people are still putting in water power systems, mechanical water power in the hill towns because electricity hasn't made there yet, right? There's a state census we have over there that has all the horsepower made by water powered wheels in the, in the Franklin County towns. Add them up, 14,000 horsepower, okay, in 1858. It's equivalent of like uh, 11 megawatts of electricity, a lot of power. A lot of power in those in those rivers okay at this time 1840s and 1850s um, Franklin County cutlery factories are making 50% of the cutlery in the United States okay uh, it, it's astounding um, this effectively <clears throat> ends Sheffield England's dominance in that industry it literally put them out of business. And what are we talking? 15, 20 years, something like that. Okay, it, it, it's phenomenal. Um, this is also an important era, 1840s and 1850s. The U.S. now surpasses Britain in arms industry um, with state-of-the-art machine tools that are developed here in Windsor, Vermont, at the armory, there's a private armory up there. They invent basically all the essential metalworking machine tools that we know today, more specifically for rifle manufacturing. In the 18, I forget what year it was, it was the Crystal Palace Exposition in London. These companies went there. Colt went there to show off his guns. The, the Windsor Armory went there to show their, their machine tools for making arms. The British immediately ordered enough machines to outfit their arsenals over there. They, they were flabbergasted, okay? You know, here it is, what, you know, a few decades after the revolution and they're overtaken in, in the arms industry, okay? Also, we're starting to see westward migration is picking up and this is fueling the need for these products. These things are, are, are these products, especially the knives, and things like this. What really puts Russell on the map was this. It's called a Green River Knife, okay? This was the indispensable tool for people migrating out west. Think about it, you know, it's a, it's, it's a frontier all the way out. Um, these kinds of tools are indispensable. Um, Greenfield now says stamped on the hilt here, Green River Works, Greenfield, Massachusetts. This puts Greenfield on the map. Everybody has to have one of these. They're reasonably um, inexpensive, Swedish steel, um, indestructible in a lot of ways. They're used for everything. Of course, they're used for a weapon. They're used for mining out small veins um, and skinning. All these things that would be essential in this time period if you're plowing your way through the through the frontier okay in the two decades of 1840 and 1850 720,000 of these are made here shipped in barrels down the Connecticut River up the Mississippi and sent out on river boats wagon trains whatever they say there's a <coughs> there's a trail of these going out west okay um, and, and something interesting that recently pulled up, if some of you might know about it, um, 1856, a riverboat called the Arabia sunk in the Missouri River. It was subsequently covered in silt and just recently was, was excavated and it was so preserved, everything on it was preserved, even food, textiles, and lo and behold, what do you think was on it? We've been in contact with them and you see other tools from here. These were the essential tools, and this is really fueling these, these industries now here. The next era, 1860s to 1900, 
Okay, so before that was more of the river barge era. You know, you had the riverboat traffic and everything. Now, now we're, and also keep in mind we're approaching Civil War time. Um, the canals in Turner's Falls are are converted um, to large scale water power. Okay. Um, some new inventions are coming along now. When you see these old mills and everything, you know, what do we think of? We think of like the old paddle wheels and things like this. Some of them did have um, very uh, sophisticated systems like that, either underneath giant wheels, paddle wheels, or over. Um, but that only got, got you so much power and it was not very controllable, okay? So 1860s, Right here in Franklin County, the Rodney Hunt Company in Orange patents what we now know now is a modern turbine water system. It's all metal. It's, it looks, if you see some of the models, it, they look like a jet engine. They've got fins and they're controlled. You can control the angles. You can control the water coming in and out. So it's a huge leap and people like Crocker and Turners see the potential and redesign the canal to feed water-powered factories all along the river, okay? I think that one stretch had something like 8,000 horsepower uh, available, okay? So, and they're, they're sure that this is gonna become the next New York City. Um, there's five boroughs of Montague, if you look, all the streets and, and, and our numbers and letter streets, they really thought that this was going to be, you know, the next biggest thing. Um, so, and a lot of people ask about how the, these water systems work. I'm just going to try and just give you a little bit of graphic. But this is, this is the waters coming in. You have fins, the turbines down here. We'll be turning a shaft that went up into the factory and the layout would have been something like that. There's your, your turbine down here, and you can see all the, the would have been leather belts and pulleys going up to every floor. That's probably what Colonel Moore's building looked like here. What else is happening at this point? In the east part of the county, in your Buckland, Shelburne, Conway, um, sophisticated hand tools are starting to be manufactured, okay? Starts out with, you know, people that were the blacksmiths, they, 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 they ramp up production, start making some sophisticated hand tools. East County, Orange, Athol, even Ashburnham, uh, high up on the Millers River, they're starting real precision manufacturing of measuring tools um, and things like that. And what do we have? The East County, I mean, the West County towns, hand tools eventually lead to the Millers Falls Tool Company, which was the second largest uh, company here. Um, the ones in the East end up Sterrett Tools, is still in existence. So um, this is the beginning of those, okay? Um, so, and companies are expanding. So when they build the the system over in Turner's, companies like Russell, the Griswold Textile up in Colerain, they decide to move to bigger digs and, and, and Russell builds a 1,200 person water powered factory there, okay? Um, and this thing is really productive. This is an example, we can pass this around. This, by the way, you see behind me, these, and, and so now we're getting to the point where, again, the democratization of these products and technology. These things are available to the common people now. And this, this is a donation we re recently got, and it kind of sparked a whole kind of, uh, you know, investigation in, into like, well, you know, what were people doing for cutlery, you know, before this? And... Through some uh, recent documents we've got from uh, Lamson, 
Um, there's some hints in there, and, and one, one is, is that most people just used knives, and it would have been a wide knife. Um, you know, there was, you know, spoons were not, didn't come along for a long time. But basically, what they're making there is, is knives and forks, right? They're making a lot of other, but, but they're getting into the domestic cutlery business. And this is an example of one of these, if you want to pass it around. These are high quality st Swedish steel with pewter inlays, okay? I've been told by Steve Smithers, who's our, our, our silversmith that's coming here next week, he's examined these because we're like, we just can't understand how they're making these because at this point in time in 1860s, 38,000 of these a day are coming out of the Russell factory. And there's some hand engraving in here and inlaying of the pewter. And you have to wonder how you're doing that. You know, how is that taking place? Of course, they had a lot of people there, but it must have been a lot of skilled help, okay? A lot of skilled people doing this. Um, the gentleman who's donating this has been collecting for 40 years. So far, he's collected. Now, they're not all, all Franklin County, but they're all American. He's collected over 460 different styles of these pewter inlays, okay? So not only they're making 38,000 a day, but there's, you know, there's hundreds of styles, okay? Um, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just phenomenal. So- Are you saying style, like you could order different styles or that each, each, each plant had a different style? No, these, these are all offered by one company, yeah. In fact, if we, we've got books, you can look in the back and they show all of them. But these, again, these are not all. There's, his collection includes probably 25 companies. You know, Franklin County probably had, a, you know, could have been as many as 20. Greenfield had, you know, like a dozen. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. But one interesting fact is he's been collecting for 40 years and He's only come across one item made in Sheffield, England. So this goes to show you by 1860, you know, Ameri Americans got its own industry here, okay? So, Can I ask a question about the steel? Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned the Swedish steel, like, when did that, and you, I'm not trying to scoop your yep, later, you but yep. how long did they keep importing from Sweden? And did they shift sources? And was England also importing from Sweden, or they were they were producing everything local, like domestically, or like? Can you just talk about? Yeah, this I don't, a bit? I don't. I mean, all those countries would have had their own steel industries, you know. I mean, it, and um, obviously, I think more, we, you know, because England probably wasn't going to sell us the raw materials right. to begin with, you know, that market never developed. Sweden was more than happy to. Uh, another hint from this recent Lampson document says that uh, we didn't even start supplying our own high-grade steel until World War I. Right. Until we needed to for like military, like well, kind well, of well, develop that whole infrastructure. Right, absolutely. Military. Now sometime in the late 1800s. He in Philadelphia yeah. actually brought it in. He, yeah. He learned how to heat treat and flatten Steel for yeah. Right. And I mean, at this point, what's coming in, because they're using punches and dies to, to blank out bla blades, you're buying sheet steel coming in, okay? Sometime in the late 1800s, you know, our own steel industry gets going. In fact, even in New England, we have, we have our own um, steel, be, you know, companies because the need, you know, when you start getting into making engines and things like that, the variations in steel uh, uh, get complicated and you get all kinds of alloys. In fact, a lot of these companies created their own alloys, like a Pratt & Whitney and all these proprietary, and we'll get into the cutting tool industry here. It's always been the secret sauce is the material because you want something to last, right? I mean, that's the real value in, in these products. Is the, is their they they last forever virtually, okay? But great questions. I mean, is this is this is yeah? yeah. Uh, you mentioned you had a friend that you asked about how they did the inlay. What did he say? He said, well, he's he's coming in next week, and I'm hoping he can elaborate. But what he said was, is if you look at these close, 
it's obviously now those where the inlay is is pocketed out it's it's somehow it's and by the way these are uh brazilian rosewood and 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 you know all these exotic south american woods too these are not and these are common folk cutlery right but he's, if you look at them you can see some slight you know mismatches and asymmetry to one side or the other because it is on both sides and so there's obvious he said there's obvious you know hand work in these and and then putting putting the pewter in is still escaping us you know on this scale i mean anybody you know you can do one of anything right yeah, but yeah. Are, yeah. Um, are, are the ones you're passing around is that a lampstand or a um i'm not sure it may it What's what's funny is um, you have to look on the knife itself. I can't it said remember. Belleville, New Jersey. Yeah. New oh. Jersey. Oh, okay. That might just be. Not, I just picked one out of uh, his. He gave us a lot of seconds and things like that. But where these, is uh, where is Russell that you're talking about? Is that in Turner's or here? Or? Well, it's it's n neither anymore. But the. Uh -huh. It's actually in a part of a company called Dexter Russell in Southbridge, Massachusetts. They, they, uh, around 1930, Russell failed. The depression kind of knocked them out of Turner's. They built the factory was way too big, and they ended up being absorbed. The name still exists. Like a lot of these these names around here still exist. The Russell Cutlery, the original one, was right down here, about a quarter mile. Okay. Then they moved over to Turner's, which is right where, like, the Discovery Center. In fact, the Great Hall of Discovery Center was a machine shop for the Russell factory. Okay. So just so you get some idea what it would look like in a water-powered mechanical manufacturing plant, a forest of belts, you know, all those line shafting would have been connected to that drive shaft coming out of the water power. And now we're in, there's a quick succession, though, from water power for a while, there were steam engines. Once we had good steam engines, they would have put stationary steam engines, hooked them right up to the same shafting, and eventually, you know, electricity would have. Uh, I, I have a question. I, I don't want to take you too far off on a tangent, but you haven't said anything about the role of sound in the Civil War. Did you have any thoughts on that? I mean, there's not a whole lot, to my knowledge, to really talk about except the fact about the cotton, you know, industry creating the money right. for this. Um, I mean, certainly, I I haven't come across anything where slaves were employed to do any of this work or, you know, anything like that. One one kind of interesting anecdote, if. You could check with the Conway historical on this one because that's the talk I heard. Is the uh, their history has it the very first mill that was built in Conway was built by a freed slave, and he had the knowledge to build a, a you know. So there's there's some interesting intersections there, but um, uh, that's about all I could offer on that um, on that subject. Um, okay. So we're still in the 1860s to 1900 era, okay? The, the, this is the large scale water power era. Um, so again, westward migration fuels the need for all these tools, all kinds of tools, okay? Um, blacksmith tools, uh, everything you would need. Um, you know, people are going out and having farms and they're isolated. They need to repair things. Um, and have things right there on the farm. So the industry here is, is ready and willing to start, uh, you know, supplying that customer base. All right, so Civil War comes, and this is where you really see a huge leap in technology, okay? Um, and I'm going to concentrate a little bit on what became Greenfield's major industry, and that was um, the tap and die industry, which is the tools used to make precision threaded devices, not just nuts and bolts, but um, all kinds of threaded devices because threaded devices really are the key to um, the, the precision mechanical world. So this, this is something um, that has eluded people making things for centuries is 
how to make a simple nut and bolt. It's just beyond human senses to hand make something like that. The geometry and the clearances and the fits and everything are beyond human senses to do. You can get close. It's amazing what a human hand, eye, and some magnifying glasses can get you, but you, you have to try real hard. And for centuries, things like nuts and bolts were handmade. Okay, so there's a real need for something like this, and we can't have sophisticated mechanical devices, products without them. Okay, so everybody is trying to figure this out. And in, in this era, up to this point, up to the Civil War, I'll pass these around. These are the general thing, and it would have been the blacksmith. You wanted something made with threads on it, you went to your blacksmith, and a tap is what cuts the inside of a nut or so uh, inside threads. And at the time it was called a jam plate, which would cut the external thread. And they really weren't cutting. It was a forming system where the blacksmith would make, the key was making this tool harder than the material that you're going to cut. But it was an arduous, labor-intensive, time-consuming thing to make a, an accurate tap, nut and bolt to go together with these tools. And I'll pass them around, and then we'll pass around what, what, what came next. Because these were made by hand, what you're passing around? Yes. Wow. Yes, absolutely. And then you can see one in the case over there we got from Cole Rain, which is really cool because it's embellished with the blacksmith's name and different little yeah. details. And so every blacksmith, and of course, you have no standardization. Uh, you know, nothing is going to fit from one town to the other, right? <laughs> so we're in a, you know, you can only go so far with mechanical stuff at this point. Um, so an interest, what happens now, Russell is lured over to Turner's Falls, which leaves the... Um, the original. Hey Jim, before you take that picture down, yeah. it's too late. <laughs> what was that showing? Uh, a metalworking shop? This, uh, this here, it's a, an artillery shell making shop. Artillery. They're making shells. You see the brass shells there, yeah. This is an interesting, I, I pulled this off there on the website. It's a guy called, uh, I can get to you, but he, he takes, this is a colorized black and white photo. And he takes all these ancient mill photos and, and brings them to life a little bit like that. So that's, that's where I got that. Yeah, so those are machine tools, like kind of lathe, but they might even be forming tools to actually form the metal instead of cutting it, you know. But that's how you would power, that's how you powered a machine tool. Now we're into the age of machine tools because we're beyond hand tools. We want to do this heavy work. We've got to have power behind it. So machine tools are being developed. So mid-1860s, Russell is lured over to Turner's Falls, which leaves their plant. That's what it looked like by the time they left, right down the river here. It's where the Arbor's Senior Center is now. 1868, something like that. 1871, a machinist from Northampton comes to Greenfield with a patent for a tool to cut precision threads, okay? Takes out the patents, gets uh, investment money, and a company called Wiley and Russell is started, and they move into this building. And the Russell name, sound familiar? This is still Russell family money uh, being reinvested in a, in a burgeoning tool industry, okay? Um, that gets things started. And they start manufacturing these tools. And we have a number of things coming together. So this would be the modern post-Civil War of what the other things I showed you there. Okay, dramatically different. And this, this is a good time to, to explain how innovation works, especially in the valley here. What did we have here? We had a building that was abandoned, but it probably had all the infrastructure for the water power intact. Okay, the, the cutlery industry has formed the basis of metalworking, metallurgy. These things are being, being understood more and more. Things like, how do you make things like this? Super high quality steel that needs to be hardened. You can't just cut that 
with steel. You need ceramics, so things like grinding coming out of the grinding wheel technology, coming out of the cutlery, things are all kind of feeding together now to give us another giant leap in, in, uh, in how we make things. And this is really, turns out, you know, it's the foundation of how everything is made. Um, 1872, 1874, this really gets established here. Um, immediately spin-offs happen. You know, somebody's got a better idea. This is the system we have here. Two people that branch off immediately are the Wells brothers who come to this complex that's here now. It's constructed for them by a guy named Invest, put up the money, a guy named Newell Snow, made money in mining. He was the second president of the Greenfield Savings Bank. He gets them guys going in here. And so this, this is how innovation in this area worked. We see time and time again, new technology, new products are actually started in a previous industry because all the faculties are likely there, okay? Um, in, with Russell, I mean, the only other place that you would have found anything like that, that metalworking would have been in the armories. But now this is starting to really blossom. So, uh, and you think about it, this is mid 1800s. In 25 years, we're flying airplanes. Okay, it can't be underestimated what this developed. I mean, you cannot make a car engine, uh, or, you know, these kinds of things without being able to make precision threaded components. Now you can put something together, take it apart, you can prototype things. It just really just amplifies this the whole manufacturing process and because it got an early start here the whole industry develops when I say an industry they're not just making the cutting tools the machines the processes haven't been invented yet and also because you're beyond human senses you have to be able to measure these things you you, you can't make it if you can't measure it so they have to develop measuring instruments also so when you say an industry grew here literally ground floor up they create all the machines all the uh the, the measuring devices which becomes products in themselves which supply the world greenfield becomes in the industrial world known for this technology um, literally over the world i mean um, and if you're a machinist anywhere in the world you know about greenfield because most of your tools will be, have Greenfield stamped on them somewhere, okay? Uh, so that was a real important, important leap. So by this time, you know, and I meant to give you a couple facts to start this out. I'll give them to you now, but I was hoping to do it at the beginning and you could see how we lead to this. Because I go up to about the World War II, early 1900s. In 1912, Greenfield per capita income was the wealthiest place on the planet. Okay, what? had the highest highest wages paid anywhere in the world. Think about it. America is ascending. It's at the top of the world, especially in manufacturing now. This is where the skilled help are, and it's all skilled help. Every job in these factories is a skilled job. Okay, by World War II. During the war production, 30% of the population, not of the working population, 30% of the population in Greenfield worked in these plants. And many, many men and women signed up for the war and they were told, you have to stay in the factory. And we've got documents of that from families who, you know, parents, whatever, were told, no, okay. So there's, there's, this is just a fact of American history is that, you know, the arms industry and the machining industry have been intertwined from the beginning of our country. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's just, you know, indelible. And I think, I think this is worth studying because of all these lingering questions we have about slavery and, um, you know, gun issues and things like that. This can give us a lot of insights how we ended up here and maybe if we understand it enough 
you know, we can pick it apart and, and kind of figure out how to, how to get back on the rails. Um, so, but did somebody have a question? Yeah, just wait, year was that again that Greenfield had the highest wages? 1912. 1912. Yeah, and we have, I have a document in the, in the archives that states that. It's a, it was an economic study. And it's not surprising. Actually, the Connecticut Valley um, was the wealthiest. It was the center of the world, late 1800s, early 1900s, literally. I mean, uh, read about Hartford. I mean, it was, um, you know, it, uh, you know, everything in a lot of fields. This became the center, the center of the world, um, and this is what powered it. Okay, it's, it became very, very wealthy. So by this time, the whole Connecticut Valley becomes a spontaneous, organized system. Okay, it's 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 not really controlled by anyone. It's sort of the result of this armory system that got started and it just evolves and um, and it, it produces such high value high value items that the world becomes it, its customer and this place becomes the wealthiest place in the world okay um, and you know some people you know it was the analogy is the Silicon Valley of its day and I mean it, it was just like that you had all these small-time entrepreneurs you know, in their garages and, and, you know, starting businesses, it all, you know, fed into one, one, one aspect of this is, is that all the money was local, okay? And this was all generated local, all the investment, all the profits, everything through this time are local. And that's why, you know, look at the banks you have up here. I read a statistic that said Greenfield had more banks per capita than any town in Massachusetts. You know, um, it's not hard to envision. Look at the houses up, up on the hills, you know. So this is from the early 1900s to World War II, and it parallels the electrical uh, transition over at, at the canal, all right? The, you know, and this is Crocker, you know, this was kind of a bad investment because, um, this is also the era when, um, you know, uh, well, I should say the, the previous era was really the kind of the end of the river traffic, too. You had the railroads coming in, 1860s, okay? River traffic wanes, railroads comes in, great, another crossroads. Greenfield is a major rail, rail crossroad. It still is. At one point, I don't know, around 1900, you had 60 trains a day stopping here, okay? Major intersection in 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 uh in traffic okay so the whole hydro thing in turners kind of goes sour because electricity comes within you know 20 years or so right i mean this is part of part of the way technology rolls on right did they have storms too wasn't there like a big flood also that well, the factory at one point yeah yeah Definitely, yeah. What, yeah, I mean, there was a big flood at Russell's, and I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but, um, you know, I mean, but they, you know, again, so the, the, the hydro system there is converted to generate electricity as early as the late 1800s, 1885 or so. Um, there's still a couple antique, you know, power stations over there, and then the Cabot is around 19 you know, 1920 or so, they just had their 100th anniversary. That's still, that's still making power. Um, and also, I mean, who pioneered that? A lot of the, like, um, the ones on the Deerfield and the Connecticut, these, these were uh, pioneered by these mill owners. They are the ones who, who invested in it, and why? Well, because, you know, the water power was very unreliable. I mean, there's times in the summer where you didn't have it. So electrical was, was the thing coming. So the mill owners um, go through that and um, along comes the electrical era. Um, 1912, one World War II era, this is where Greenfield becomes a very important place in precision manufacturing. Um, on the eve of World War I, um, the armory, and by the way, the armory was making all the small weapons for the Defense Department from 1794 to 1968, okay? So think about it, this is part of the whole, like I weave this into the gun issue, is during, the, I mean, literally we the people controlled arms manufacturing. 
it slowly drifted out by this system into private energy. But at some point, 1968, and it wasn't just a place where they stored guns. They made, was, in fact, all the uh, STCC buildings were the manufacturing, okay? So at, by this time, Greenfield Tap and Die not only is making these cutting tools, but they're also making the special, what were called gauges, which is part of mass production, simplified measuring instruments to check very quickly mass production, okay? Greenfield Tap and Die becomes a standard which only a handful of companies in the United States attain, maybe four, five, six, which means that they were at such level of precision that they were the top level producer of the measuring instruments and everybody's own instruments are calibrated against them, okay? This becomes really important during the wars because you have like approximately 10,000 factories in the country making armaments and four companies which they all have to basically um, um, gauge all their measuring instruments too. At this, by this time, before World War I, the armory in Springfield has become antiquated. There was a Spanish-American war, but there's really not a whole lot going on between the Civil War and, and World War I. They realize that they're, they're antiquated. They actually contract with Greenfield Tap and Die to come into the armory and basically redo the whole system and, and create modernization, quality control system. And so... Um, that's how Greenfield and the armories are very closely linked um, in, in that regard, okay? Um, and the wars, the world wars just fuel the need for manufactured uh, products. And um, so uh, right, right through World War II, this is kind of the, the you know, this period where, where this is, um, you know, uh, basically um, we're, we're the best in the world at doing this and the world is buying everything from us right up to World War II um, all these tools you see I mean these basic cutting tools and everything they're needed for manufacturing no matter where in the world they were the best value that you could buy and literally up to the World War II started our enemies were buying these and you know you can debate on the ethics of all that, but it was just the best. And we have testimony here from uh, documented testimony from infantrymen from Greenfield going through, um, after D-Day, going through the uh, Europe and coming, coming across burnt out German tanks with Miller's Falls and Greenfield Tap and Die tool sets in them. So there you go, okay? So what's kind of the result of all this? Well, it's a lot of social and economic benefits that come from this heritage. I mean, all through this time, 150 years, there's unlimited opportunities for workers and immigrants. The 150 years of these accumulated skills and knowledge and worldwide markets helps the region weather the Great Depression. No problem here, okay? We, and, and, that, and, and we maintain technological supremacy, leaving these industries poised for World War II production that allows the Allies to, <clears throat> to prevail. And historians agree that that's, that's the case, okay? Um, unfortunately, by the 1980s, this elegant, truly American phenomenon was virtually dismantled by misguided policies and globalization, okay? But good news is, is that this, this, this heritage survives. I mean, it's, it's really ingrained here. It's just part of the people that have lived here a long time and the people that, that transplant here, okay? Um, and unlike other New England cities, the diversity of created, creative crafts and industries here and an unyielding sense of independence and problem solving prevented us from total bust. It's, Greenfield's never been busted like a lot of these New England towns with one, you know, one industry, you know, thing. So, and the heritage survives now in many small shops and with creative people 
who keep this spirit alive, okay? The rest of this building is full of those people. We have all kinds of arts and crafts people here. And that's part of the mission of the museum is to keep, keep this site here. Something's been being made here for 320 years on this site. And we're going to try and keep, keep that going. Um, okay, just one, one last thing I want to point out because it's... Uh, uh, you, 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 you learn this, you have to say, how did this happen here? You know, we really... And, and this has actually a st uh, been studied by the Smithsonian called the Lemelson Project of Innovation, and it studied regions around the country that have this phenomenon, industries that really blossomed. And why, why did this, you know, why does it happen in one place and not another, okay? Because all these things weren't invented here. Things are bubbling up every, everywhere, but something causes things to congeal and happen in one place, okay? And anybody who wants any more information on it, I, I got it on our, our website, the actual study. One of the studies was Hartford and the Connecticut Valley, okay, which really incorporated all this, and that was one of them. Um, and um, so, so really, in essence, what made this happen here, we had abundant natural resources, a good agricultural base, Lots of water power, you had transportation with the rivers early on, you had capital, you had money. None of this would have happened without people taking a chance and investing in these, these upstarts. And we had higher education institutions, which, you know, since, you know, like you, you know, the land grant colleges and everything, since then have been, um, you know, steady launching of new technologies coming out to be products. And that's some of what's going on here today. The two companies that I work for mainly here were spin-off technologies from UMass in, in electronics and uh, healthcare. And so it's a little different. We don't have the thousands of people working in big factories anymore, but in all these little shops around here, people are still pioneering um, cutting edge, pun intended, you know, items, okay? Um, so, um, also I wanna, uh, and, and, and so, and also, why are so many creative people drawn here and decide to stay? I mean, I'm a transplant myself, although earlier ancestor was here in Greenfield, but, you know, there's so many people that come to school here, whatever, jobs, I came here for a job. I wasn't born in Greenfield, ended up coming here for a job, just like many other tool makers, Traveled around looking for jobs. I ended up here, okay? So, um, and um, if you get a chance when it comes out, at the Shea Theater the other night for the kickstart for this uh, uh, was um, an eloquent talk by Professor uh, Leo Juan from uh, UMass. And um, really try to, try to get a hold of that. It'll be on uh, Montague Cable TV at some point. We're going to try and get it on our... But he had some really good, more than I could ever uh, describe, reasons for this. You know, some poetic reasons why, what's here? What makes this? Because it always has been able to have a renaissance. You know, we've, when these, all these companies closed, it was very depressing and, you know, people just didn't see the value in all this. But now, starting, we're starting to see a, a little renaissance with, you know, art and crafts and um, trying, to, trying to save some of these old skills and things like that. That's very big in the museum world now is uh, uh, preserving skills. So um, I'm about done, so if you <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>